Hi there, it's Amy from Click Roll Boom, and today I'll be catching up with Manchester based metalcore outfit Pleiades, who are about to unleash their debut album, Affinity With, which comes out on September 29th. <laughs> who are Pleiades? Um, like, what is your history? How did you form? How long have you been going? Um, so the band initially started as like a kind of instrumental three piece. Uh, neither of us were actually in it in okay. the very in the very beginning, and then uh, they eventually branched out into wanting to add vocals to it. And I auditioned for it, and fortunately was chosen. And then a, a year, two years later, yeah, that's when I joined. Yeah, yeah years we were we worked we worked together, and um, sort of found out we had very similar interests. And mm. Ryan was looking for a band, and fortunately. He wanted to join, and then we became the five piece we are now. So have you all been in bands before, or is this a first venture? It's, it's actually my first ever band. Okay. Like, uh, it's something I wanted to do for kind of a number of years without really ever having the confidence to properly go into it. But the the advert I'd seen for the band, which I found on Gumtree of all places, the 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 bands that they'd listed as like their influences and kind of. The sound they wanted to go for was was like Circus Survive, Devil Sold the Soul, and Jimmy Eat World. Mm -hmm. For me, felt like like a perfect kind of like template for what I wanted out of a band. So I went for it. Cool. Um, so how would you describe your sound? You take it. Still, we get asked yeah. quite a bit. And I think obviously you don't. We, we do feel that we have a unique sound because I feel like we all, all five of us have such. We don't really all listen to the same music, which I think has been to our initially was a bit of a curse trying to get shows trying to describe our sound to other bands mm -hmm. and other promoters being like oh we sound like these guys what do you yeah. think but we kind of struggled at the start so it was kind of like a, a mix of kind of sort of late 90s early 2000s post hardcore with kind of bits of post metal and post rock as well yeah see um, when i was listening to your your latest cp your sound goes from almost an indie type sound into something quite brutal and it comes from nowhere. So normally in metalcore, you can tell that it's building up to that moment. But yeah. I wasn't, particularly the Universal, I wasn't expecting it. It just came from out of what, what to me was almost an indie type song. And then someone screaming. And it was like, oh, this is different. I think that's been kind of what we wanted was it's a fine line between just kind of like um, sort of taping sections of music onto the end without any real kind of rhyme or reason. But with the album, we really wanted to to have them really delicate sounds and they're almost like indie yeah. indie type sounds with the heavy stuff but yeah. make it make sense as opposed to just kind of almost like for shock value or to yeah. like you said for yeah, it to be definitely. unexpected yeah. as yeah, long as it makes sense on the ep it's some of it's a bit dreamy and a little bit it, it's very it's very unique um in sound it's not just oh this is post hardcore it, it's very it's very individual definitely i think i think that was the thing with like songwriting for the new stuff that's coming out was like taking a step back and then working out what, what we actually did like and what kind of did work in yeah. song structures or rather than yeah like you said tagging bits together and we kind of we kind of are writing stuff in a bit of a from a different perspective so i've been like which dreamy bit will work here does it does it need it or you know kind of working backwards which has been really nice so do you sing and scream or do you just do the clean vocals no i do the I, to be honest, I think the screaming is the stuff that I, I feel strongest doing. And okay. like predominantly kind of been my thing. I think um, our bass player, Josh, he sings with me as well. Yeah. So he kind of is, he does the harmonies with me. Mm -hmm. And then live, we do we have parts where he will just do the cleans just to kind of preserve my my own voice a little bit. Yeah. But but yeah, I think um, I, I, do, I do both, but I get a lot of help from Josh and kind of like helping yeah. refine the singing and making sure it's... Uh, it's mutually beneficial to both mm. rather than just being like I'm doing all the vocals like to have him there as well yeah. is really like giving it such a different dimension and giving me like you know you're feeding off each other's ideas and I yeah. I give him backing vocals or he is my backing vocals so it's there's a nice fluidity to it. Is it hard to switch between the two in terms of your voice is it like is it a strain on your voice to go from singing to screaming and, and back? I think, honestly, we we just had some shows with uh, You Win Again Gravity in August. I think it was the first time I'd really properly had to had to take a step back and think about preservation in terms of my voice. And yeah. cause screaming's fun on the first show, the second <laughs> show, where it's like you've got all yeah. the sort of fresh energy. But on that third and fourth show, you're kind of thinking about, OK, what's what's necessary? What, what heavy parts are more necessary than others? So, yeah, uh, so yeah it's... Um, it's been a real lesson sort of 
learning how to do it properly. There's probably a lot of stuff I could I could reach out to, and you know, there's a lot of stuff on TikTok and Instagram about how to scream safely, oh, okay. whether, whether it's possible. So I'm, um, yeah, I'm looking to explore ways just to sort of preserve my voice. And... Yeah, because you must end up with a shelf life if you're screaming. Your voice must have a shelf life that it can't withstand it for like decades. No, I think there are some artists that you see, and like I think when you see bands like you're talking about metalcore bands that start really heavy and eventually they transition to yeah. like much softer style and in my head as an artist now a lot of that kind of makes sense because mm-hmm. you get more confident singing you're screaming yeah. stuff you're probably less angry than you used to be yeah, definitely. Uh, so like, architects are a really good example like their singing is just as strong as they're screaming yeah but it's like you do have a much shorter shelf life yeah. if you're just screaming for 10 15 years <laughs> How do you discover? This is something I've always wondered. How do you discover you can scream? Because obviously, if you're you can you find that you can sing because you're singing along to the shower in the shower or singing yeah. to the radio or whatever. How do you do? You sit there and think I'm going to try and scream and see what it sounds like. How do you come to realise that you can do it in some sort of tune? I think a lot of it comes from if you're not particularly confident in singing. There's a lot of there's a lot of areas in singing where you can kind of fall into holes where you kind of lose pitch or lose key. Where in screaming, it feels very much like a it's an all or nothing kind of technique yeah. for me anyway, because it's like you can't really half scream or else it just no. doesn't work mm-hmm. or you just hurt yourself. But yeah. I think there was a lot of trial and errors, a lot of like practice sessions coming back and even doing it for half an hour, I'd be really sore. Yeah. But now I can do it for, you know, sort of three, four hours <laughs> and feel pretty confident about it. I won't feel fantastic about it, but yeah, I, I, I don't know there was I think it, it was just a lot of perseverance of being like I know I can do this and I, I know I know I have a unique screaming style mm-hmm. and it's something I always get complimented on as well so it's something that I just I want to make sure it has that um that place in all the music we do yeah. but yeah just I, I guess just practicing going to going to the practice room and knowing you have that comfort to, to scream yeah. without alerting neighbors or yeah of scaring anyone <laughs> around you so, so yeah just just eliminating any doubts that like no one cares what, how much noise you're making just you've got nothing to lose now so so yeah so what other musicians have influenced your sound you mentioned you don't all like the same bands so what sort of bands have kind of come uh, so like vocally i've always been into like sort of obviously glass jaw a big big favorite of mine let live as well when they were around mm-hmm. and uh, I guess obviously some of them like early metalcore bands are like we're well, growing up like Under Oath was such a big thing and uh, that kind of uh, half screaming half singing style is kind of whether I like it or not has bled into very much a lot of a lot of the style I've got yeah. now so yeah that kind of 2005 post hardcore scene that was that was kind of MTV <laughs> at the time yeah and then I mean you're you're kind of more of a post rock yeah I guess that would be like traditional instrument uh, traditional you know what i mean like a uh, classic like post-rock instrumental bands yeah. through to like i was like basement and stuff like that like, all the room, room for cover records stuff i was well into that yeah so i guess that kind of bleeds into my playing style mm-hmm. and like andrew the other guitarist is well into like you said before jimmy well like he's, he's stuff, more like, punk orientated where like he's a lot of the kind of scrappier melodies and the scrappier kind of guitar parts come from like, you know, like the Wonder Years, Lawrence Arms, yeah. that kind of like American punk scene yeah. that is much more direct. Mm-hmm. And then obviously you bring the atmosphere almost combined with, you know, our drummer's very, he's very, he likes a lot of chaotic, he's, quite, he's, he's, a lot he's of not... ugly music, if I'm honest. <laughs> it's, um, like, it's all or nothing. With the yeah, music, it's, it's like, he likes a lot of like D-beat, punk, hardcore, sort of yeah. grindcore, stuff that's kind of quite abrasive. And our bass player, Josh, he loves like all the cheesy pop punk and, you know, classic Metallica, Trillium. Yeah. So you get just enough of each to kind of yeah. hopefully correctly sound that when people listen, they see it uh, as unique, but not as kind of like just parts clipped together that it has, yeah. it has a unique focus. It's unique, but it's not experimental. It all flows. It all yeah. goes together. There's an accessibility to it that yeah. isn't just like it's not. It's not avant-garde where it's no. kind of just kind of no, it's not people off. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. So, if you all got different influences coming from different places, does that ever cause disagreements, or are you all fairly harmonious? To be honest, I think we wish we had more disagreements. Okay. I think because we're all we are all good friends and yeah. we all respect each other's opinions and sort yeah. of uh, inspirations, but. There's definitely a few bits like when we were recording this new album, 
we'd like done pre-production days and like think we had, we had like eight tracks out of the ten kind of ready yeah. we were happy with them whatever went into the studio and there's just like one section at the end of a track and we, we'd had like we this was like day five of our day four of five recording kind of thing and it was like got to the end section and we were all just sat there like this just doesn't yeah. work and then some like i can't remember it was i'm not going to drop people in it but <laughs> they were like this has to stay this is it this is the section we were like nah we're gonna have to go away and like stay up to whatever time to rewrite this tonight to then record tomorrow yeah. so i think it's I, I don't think there's a stubbornness to it no, I, think I, it's just like... I think when we had that initial kind of like um first disagreement it kind of was a bit of a chain reaction when we sort of like we're looking at the rest of the album going okay so what what can be it's more about what can be better as opposed yeah. to what we don't like so yeah. it's all it's all for the greater good of of like the album piece at the end yeah but then i think it's just it was just healthy to see like you know i like it i know what you're doing but that can be better that can be better yeah. we can pull back a little bit we can do less here and actually achieve more yeah. which is a, i it's think one was... of the disagreements that in the long run will help because it's rather than just accepting something you kind of throw ideas around to make it better yeah i think the part yeah. ryan's alluding to is, is is the ending to a particular song that should have been i think almost like three or four minutes longer than it needed to be yeah. And I think we all just, including the producer, just kind of looked at each other and we were like, this feels like overkill. So let's yeah. let's pull it back, let's trip it back and we can achieve a lot more with, you know, yeah. a fifth of the time. Yeah, I think so, that's what Joe said. Like, yeah, Joe Clayton, who we recorded, but he was just like, got to the end of the tape, you know, we we're all just sat and he's like, what What are we doing here? Like, yeah. what, what is this? Yeah. It, is it, you know. I think, I think so. nowadays less is more. I think back in the kind of eighties, nineties, a long song was acceptable. But I think now short and sharp to keep people's interest is a lot more what goes down better. Yeah, unless it unless it's in particular scenes, like the proggier scenes where kind yeah. of like they indulge a lot more, but yeah, you know, we we want to have moments that are a bit more impactful. Like we our previous material have been, you know, five, six minute songs that have been you know, more post metal and post rock, but now the focus of the album was to be like, you know, what can we, how much impact can we make with our ideas without having to tail off into, you know, prog metal territory and sound like opus. Yeah. yeah. Um, where did your songwriting inspiration come from? Uh, do you mean like sort of lyrically or, or the whole package? How, how we piece things together? I yeah. think. I think as a as a group, initially we had like kind of like a jam, almost atmosphere where we would we would spend a couple of hours like in a particular piece and then maybe chip away and and um, narrow it down to the parts we thought were worth keeping. But I think I think now everyone's got a bit more confidence in bringing their own ideas and be like, right, this is what I want it to sound like. Yeah, this is what this is what my vision for it. I think one of the songs in the album you had. Kind of almost already built so the skeleton was there from from drums guitar and the atmosphere and like the length of it as well so it was nice to have this kind of alternative way of doing it where you could almost you were kind of almost filling the gaps and taking little pieces away as opposed to like carving a whole mm -hmm. a whole song out of nothing so it's i think we've toyed with a few different styles really yeah. i think it's uh i think we're, it's still developing all the time i think i think i like, would that track Lumen, you'd kind of said that you wanted that to be a track title. Yeah. And it was kind of like it, how how to interpret that as a as a track, I suppose. So it was just a case of sitting down demoing stuff and then taking it to everyone, like you said, and then it just got pulled apart and then stuck back together in a way that kind of worked. Yeah. Worked worked for all of us. So what tends to come first, the musical or lyrics? So I think for me, this has been one of my big lessons that I would overindulge in the words to make them fit the song as opposed to okay. actually doing it the other way which i think towards the end of the album i you know i obviously getting feedback on the songs all the time and you know people liked what they were hearing but there's sometimes a case for me where I, it was too busy and too it was too to say instead of actually trying to service the song itself yeah but um i think it was actually like in honey guide i think there was a lot of stuff it was almost like meandering kind of verses and I feel like I was losing sense of what the melody was I was losing sense of what actually people were going to hear okay, yeah it's opposed to just like these are the lyrics I want yeah so it's I think hard not to get like that though 
if you've got something you want to say, it must be hard not to get on a one track with the words. Yeah, I think lyric, lyrics is the stuff that I actually probably enjoy the most that song, right? And it's just like writing stuff down and finding like a subject or a message I really want to get across. Yeah. But at the end of the day, you actually do the, the message a disservice by, by saying too much. So I think uh, Honey Guide is a really good example. Like the early demos I had of that was just far too busy. Mm. And there's the one I have now listening to it. It says everything I, I needed it to say with, you know, much less words. <laughs> um. You're about to put out your new record, Affinity With. What's the story behind that? Uh, if, as, a, as a title or just like thematically all around? Yeah, just about the record, sort of um, behind the, the words, the story behind just, just how it came to be. So I think yeah. a lot of the, the subjects of each song was kind of like different instances of, of how greed and the consequences of like, especially human greed mm -hmm. sort of show themselves in later life, whether it's like personal greed or historical greed, or even like greed that's seen kind of in a more natural environment. I've, I seem to have a lot of subject titles and song titles that end up being bird names for some reason. I'm not entirely sure why. But if any with as well was just kind of like, it's a definition of, of kind of what empathy is and kind of yeah. understanding of one another. So I wanted to basically have ten, 10 different kind of subjects and 10 different stories of, of, um, of greed in different ways and how it can be sort of uh, different perspectives yeah. can be born from it. Is this from real life experience or are these sort of? It's very much a mixture. I think there's there's um, there's one, the last song, No Living Thing is something that's a very like, it's like a, a personal story of mm -hmm. like a friend of mine and his kind of family dynamic and other things are just kind of like how um, our relationship with with nature as well and also like more historical ones like siberian which is based around just sort of like how how wealth affects uh like monarchies and you know certain stories around that so i wanted to cover it all i wanted to cover every instance of how how greed and how wealth and how how understanding can basically be be shown across 10 different tracks in that sense it's quite different to a lot of standard metalcore type type music because a lot of the time that's about love and loss and relationships so actually you've got a bit more depth in what you've been writing about yeah no definitely i think i i my favorite band as well is me without you mm -hmm. i think they have a lot of like faith driven music without it being like religious championing kind of music it's okay. more about exploration of faith yeah. different faiths whether it's christianity or islam or, mm -hmm. or judaism and i wanted to i want it to be like an immense reflection really and be able to take these stories from different parts of the world from different faiths and different and different perspectives and be able to yeah like you said give these songs like a, a different depth and a different dimension that isn't just kind of like a a kind of tried and tested kind of yeah. storytelling yeah. way when it comes to loss whether it's drug addiction or alcoholism or kind of like love or anything like that like I'd, I think when I find a song that has an immense story or has three or four different layers to it, it keeps me engaged for much longer and it becomes something that I re I go back to years later and feel like, you know, it, it was saying a lot of different things and it kind of, it can stay with you throughout your life. It can stay Definitely. things, it can say things to you when you're a teenager, whether you're an early adult or as you get yeah. even older. So it's kind of yeah. timeless. So I'm hoping, yeah. hoping it gets I to that. So. I think because the love and loss and relationships i feel like they can be sometimes be a very young theme you know sort of teenagers and in your 20s i think once you start leaving that and you want to appeal to an older audience i think you need a bit more depth a bit more substance to what you're singing about yeah definitely i think it's i think our audience especially the audience we're trying to cultivate is one that is searching for a little bit deeper meaning with the music like i, I do like enjoy metalcore enjoy metal for for, for what it is but, but like you said, the staying power for the songs yeah. isn't always as much as I'd like it to be. Whereas, you know, stuff that I listened to from like 2005, 2015, they they say stuff that was relevant then, but also relevant now. Definitely. And, you know, people listen to music for different things, whether it is just for like the, the banger material <laughs> or whether it's for something they can take with them for the rest of their life. So, so yeah, it's, it's, a, it's about just giving... I want to give our songs the, the best chance to to give it the staying power yeah, as well. Definitely. 
So have you gigged much? What's been your biggest show to date and your favourite? What's your favourite? What's your favourite is? Um, I think most recently it was like that run that you were saying before, you win, you win again gravity, like moving, playing shows down south, like places we'd, we'd not been to before, you know, um, and seeing the, re the kind of reception we were getting there people actually kind of knowing who we were <laughs> and it's that age old thing being like, oh my God, people actually know, know the tunes and like, yeah. um, people were ex really excited to see us. Um, I think that makes such a difference on a show, you know, you could be playing in front of 10 people or like we played at Death Institute kind of sold out numbers before. Yeah. Um, it's nice having that, you know, you take different things from different shows. So, yeah. so it's most of your gig and being around sort of Manchester in the North. Hundred percent. Yeah, I think. Well, actually, as a band, like we've been around for in the current iteration, we've been around like sort of like what four four years, would you say? We we really only played like maybe sort of thirty to fifty shows, which okay. isn't that met. Obviously, we had lockdowns stuff like that. Of that yeah, so. yeah, yeah, but as we we still feel like we've we've got a lot of mm -hmm. live ground to cover. So when we get the opportunity to play down south, it's you know whether it is you know to twenty thirty people like they they come to us and they maybe listen to us beforehand and they feel like it's going to be, like you said, almost dreamy, quite melodic. And yeah. then you get hit in the face. <laughs> Definitely. I think when we go down south, we want to make sure we have, we have a lasting impression. So it's yeah. about coming in with a lot of intensity, a lot of energy that they perhaps weren't expecting. Yeah. Cause I feel like we, we are this kind of anomaly where mm -hmm. people aren't quite sure how to, how to genre no. us. So yeah, we can catch people unaware. We can catch people off guard. Definitely. And and you know, <laughs> hopefully be remembered. I think what was it? Was it Kingston? Yeah. Yeah, we played we played like Kingston and Guildford for the first time. Guildford's yeah. like a sleepy, <laughs> lovely little village and yeah. felt quite quite cruel playing there. But <laughs> the venue the you know, the venue with venue and the promote were really good. The audience were amazing. Yeah. And um yeah, just some kind of unexpected shows that have just been that stay with us as well. I think in terms of shows now it's it's like you say about the amount that we've kind of played over the four years it's only in like the past year or so i think we've we've had something that we really want to get out there and yeah. like you know we want people to hear this people need to hear this kind of thing and it's like really amping up like we'll play anywhere we'll go we'll drive anywhere yeah. you know <laughs> hop, hop in the van take the stuff yeah. we just want to be in front of people yeah. i think it's really nice having like this, this new body of work yeah definitely. being like we just want to get it out there so, so are you planning on touring the new album yeah, we have a we have a week booked in uh, mm -hmm. October tenth to the fifteenth with uh, a band called As Living Arrows, okay. uh, formerly known as Dead Bird. Which had, uh, did a whole rebranding. Very excited to play with them. They're like a really, I think they're described as like a post post screamo almost. Okay, yeah. So they, you know, they they have a lot of a lot of really strong characteristics as a band, as people, and as as a sound that we are very kind of like very proud to be associated with. So. It'll get two very complementary bands, but with kind of very different sounds. Yeah. I think that works quite well when you're similar but not identical. I mean, I've been, I've seen gigs where the lineup's been too similar and it's yeah. all blended into one. But then I've also been in contrast to ones where you've had three bands that are completely different and don't fit together at all, and you can see the room clear out in between each band. Yeah, it's it's a fine line. I think when we were presented with with them supporting us. I, I'd listened to them before they'd played festivals and shows that that I was familiar with. And I felt it just felt like a very suitable band and a very kind of like we would we would be helping them. They would be helping us as well yeah. in terms of like the, the sort of discourse of the evening, hopefully leaving no one any room to go on a break. Are they a Manchester band as well? So now they're based in Brighton. OK, so our tour starts in London and okay. Brighton. Yeah. So it gives an opportunity to we, we've never played Brighton before. Very excited yeah. to play. So we'll um, get the long drive out the way yeah. for a little bit and then sort of make our way up towards kind of where our audience is more familiar with us, uh, sort of Birmingham, Manchester, and then finally ending in Edinburgh for the first time. Oh, wow. It's quite a, quite a lot of ground then. It's a full, uh, it's a full it's scale. It's going to be a yeah. heavy six days. <laughs> <laughs> um, do you ever suffer from stage fright? And if you do, how do you overcome it? You so so dealer, you. <laughs> so I uh, ritual. You know, I yeah, I like to have a little, maybe a little tequila before going on stage. Just, just one or two, just to kind of like settle myself. Especially if it's been like 
Um, I always find it much harder to play in like hometown shows. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people do just because you're surrounded by perhaps people who know you. Yeah. Other than your kind of like band mm -hmm. character almost. So I think in terms of stage fright, there was a time where I, I kind of did let it kind of control me a bit. I think eventually you get to a point where it's like you've got this far, yeah. you've recorded all this material, you've done all these shows now. You've got nothing to you've got nothing to fear. People enjoy your live show. There's there's no there's no point in doubting yourself so, you now because you're yeah. doing for me, I'd be doing a disservice to the people around me who mm. are putting just as so much effort. And for me to, you know, run off to the toilet and not come back, yeah. <laughs> it'd just be a shame. I think, I, think you... we, sorry, I was just gonna say I, I feel like we've all got such a confidence like between us as yeah. a band now. Yeah. That the nerves just kind of dissipate when you like I, I know that OJ's like, you know. He's got this, and as long as he's in, I'm in. And then yeah. you look at other Andrew, and he's like climbing stuff, and you're like, oh well, if he's, you know, he doesn't show any nerves whatsoever. It's like, what have I got to be nervous yeah. about, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, do you have any like ritual before you go on stage? Just kind of, I think we're 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 all kind of quite close as friends, so like we don't take the the process too seriously, mm -hmm. which I think is something that we comes with our personality as a band like the music's serious the subject's quite serious but in terms of like how we act and how we um with each other yeah. we just want to make sure that we're all enjoying it yeah and that at the end of the day if one of us is is sort of has stage fright then i think we'd all rally around and and get them back into the uh back into the groove of it but yeah we just we just make sure we're all chatting before and we watch the other bands we we just sort of soak it all in Definitely. And then you just switch on. Yeah. I think the thing with music is, although you can deliver a serious subject matter, music is still supposed to be a form of entertainment. It's still supposed to be fun. So I think yeah. even if you are singing about something that's quite gloomy, there still has to be that element of enjoyment from your side for the listener to then get the same enjoyment. Yeah. If, if you are not enjoying it, why should they, basically? Yeah. So like I said, if, even if it is quite a morbid subject, like you kind of, you just switch on, you become... Yeah. your stage character without having to wear makeup or face paint or anything Definitely. it's just yeah. uh and then as soon as it's done it's i mean as when you're on stage it's over it's over before before you know it so most of the time i never really have chance to get <laughs> any stage right <laughs> has the fan ever asked you anything particularly strange or particularly sweet um i mean we i had a we had someone asked for a signed set list, which felt very early for the, for that kind of that kind of request. But <laughs> I've had I've had like people ask me about my technique. They're like, "Oh, what kind of screaming do you do?" And I'm like, honestly, like I, I'm not going to try and pretend I've I'm sort of formally trained or anything. I just like it's just an energy and a passion thing. And they're like, "Oh, you know, you guys, you know, you sound great up there." So that's that's always great. In terms of strange ones, um. I don't think anything too strange yet. I've had like sort of you got that to come. Yeah, I've had like 13, 14 year old kids like with their parents, you know, sort of praising me and saying how good I sound on stage, how good we all sound. And it's yeah. them kind of interactions, you're like, God, that's actually really cool. Cause you know, you've been 13, 14 and you've seen bands you like on stage and you never really actually ever believe you're gonna be yeah. the band that a kid is kind yeah. of idolizing, I guess. So that's that that was really cool. I know recently, like we we played a show, and I was just kind of like just out of earshot of OJ, the, the drummer. Just some guy who's talking to him, you know, saying it like really enjoyed the set, or whatever. And he he said to OJ, he was like, you, "You're the best drummer I've seen in a very very long time." And obviously, he didn't realize that I'd heard it as well, and I could just see him beaming. And <laughs> the whole night after that, he was just like absolutely buzzing. And I was like, oh. <laughs> didn't say anything. I was like, oh, that's so sweet. He's just like, yeah, taking that in. Brilliant. Um, who would you might most like to go on tour with? Go on. Well, I don't know. Currently, um, someone like Alexis on Fire, I feel like it's like, you know, we've all seen them so many times before yeah. and it's like they're doing it, the bigger shows and it's like, that would be just a great tour to be on, I feel. Um, yeah, that's really, I think I'd agree with that. I think me and Ryan went to download uh, and saw them play and they're a band that you watch because they are just kind of five friends on stage playing yeah. like interesting music and they're a band that you look at and you like you, you feel a kind of uh reflection of yourself in them yeah and so like god that would be really cool if we ever got to 
that that kind of stage. So you know, obviously, you just and feel like being around them as well would be mm-hmm. would be a lot of fun, and they don't take themselves too seriously. But yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. Or um, I guess I guess Glassjaw if they're still if they still fancy playing. A lot of the bands I think I like now are, uh, are not going like Dillinger it's Escape Plan. Like yeah, it's um, <laughs> so in terms of yeah, I'd have to go, I'd have to go like some fire I think as well. Um, would there be any others? I think I'm sort of thinking like smaller bands, but yeah, I, I think there's a, there's a quite a few bands in the kind of arc tangent scene that I feel mm. who we're we're becoming kind of friends with through yeah. the, as bands as well, and uh, you know we're we're big fans of like Pine okay. and like Kirsty's Metal Hands, who are kind of like Joe from Pine is was the producer on the record, and we kind of like love all the bands he's associated with. So okay. any anyone on a kind of who gets that kind of upper echelon of of our tangent would be we feel we would we would get along well with and feel like we could we wouldn't we wouldn't let them down as a support band so so yeah any, anyone anyone from um a kind of like maybe like a uh was it and so i watch you from afar or something like that never got with them but yeah i mean yeah. it's just i think i think maybe it's someone like loathe yeah as well that, yeah. like seeing seeing like the trajectory that Loath are on um being a band from the northwest as well mm-hmm. and kind of like seeing them years ago in the star and garter in manchester and then you know they're doing these huge american tours now and it's is they, they now have that thing where it's like we were saying before you know they have these like dreamy kind of slower ambient e- ethereal stuff and then you hear the heavy stuff like like god or something like that it's, it's literally in the title like <laughs> you know it's, it's like pure energy and yeah. like you know heavy music um yeah, I feel you'd, like... need, you'd need to be on a lineup with someone where the sound was as diverse as yours yeah yeah that's exactly. a, that's a really good point yeah um are you taking a break now the album's about to come out or is it re- writing and recording like a perpetual process i think it's not really a conversation with we i think we've we've toyed with the idea of of just keeping slowly writing new stuff but i think the album was such a it's our first i think your debut album's such a big deal yeah and we want to give it the opportunity to to kind of like grow yeah. it isn't we, we know like releasing an album isn't about that immediate kind of like reaction you know like when it used to be when it was all about the hype almost and mm-hmm. then it was about the first couple of weeks after it's now about um having the album out being able to show it as a whole piece to people and just and maybe giving it it's it's its spot yeah just to grow and um perhaps you know be appreciated as as much as we love it we want to we want to make sure it's uh it's given a proper opportunity before we like jump because jump into any new music i think will you be releasing more singles off it to ask we've released most of them okay <laughs> which is i think there's only really i think three or four left and i think we'd like them tracks now to be ones that perhaps people discover as opposed to that okay. ones yeah. that we give them yeah so I think we've released six of them since February and the uh, three or four that are left that, you know, they're kind of, we want a couple of deep cuts. Let's, yeah. you know, let's leave them for the people to discover. Once we're ready. Releasing albums is becoming more of a rarity. People seem to just put out singles and singles and maybe the occasional EP. So I think actually putting a full album out is quite rare. I think when we, when we wanted to release it and we were chatting with uh, Matty uh, Lissett, who has really helped us kind of like build our campaign and build our brand. As a band for the album he you know he suggested like how would you feel about doing maybe doing two eps mm-hmm. and i think having written the album as an album yeah to then release it as anything else would feel kind of disingenuous yeah so it like it's it's not been easy it's not been easy getting all the stuff together to get it out and it's been a big learning curve but you know to have it out as a full album just felt mm-hmm. like the right thing to do yeah so you talk about you didn't want to release it as anything other than an album because that's how you'd written it does it frustrate you when people don't listen to the album in order because obviously you've thought about what order the song should be and how the story should go does it frustrate you when people just get on shuffle i don't know if i can get too mad because i've still got an ipod shuffle <laughs> I, I so, all my music so <laughs> so, so that yeah i i think it's and no i can't i can't be too mad about it i think the songs themselves stand alone yeah. as as single songs that like you don't need to have heard the one before and the one after to really get it i think like you said it's quite an eclectic mix of styles yeah. and i think the songs stand by themselves so yeah. i i mean i still shuffle my music i'm not i'm not gonna i'm not gonna get too mad about it it's it's it 
it's produced in a way though where all the tracks do meld so it would be one continuous mix if you were to listen to it i think because we always have that thing in the back of our head about it being a, a piece you know yeah. like it like a a body of work um so it does and i know that josh the bassist had the idea of having it you know like printed to record and it just like continuous playing i mean i love the idea of that as well but yeah we're gonna take take what we get Maybe everyone should listen to it in order first and then shuffle it after that. Give it one yeah, yeah, yeah. through in order. <laughs> That's the advice, yeah. We need yeah. to get that printed to like send it out with the stuff. Like. I, think it, I think it's perhaps now, like you said, release albums are rare enough and yeah. like EPs and singles are much more preferred, I think, for it just to be out yeah. as, a, as a collection of 10, 10 different songs that they're all ours. It feels like we know we've got like a, a really strong foundation now for yeah. people to perhaps take from certain songs to say, I really love this part of your style. I really love this part of your sound. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, you know, in the future, like we're not, we're not entirely sure which parts of the album that we take forward. We may yeah. feel more akin to, to something earlier on that we've done yeah. uh, earlier on in the writing process or something that feels really new. So I'm just, I'm really curious to see what the reaction is to, to, to any and all of the songs individually. The most important thing you're saying you don't know which part you'll take forward i suppose the most important thing is always staying true to yourself so not thinking oh if i become if we become a pop band we'll sell more units it's always yeah. at least being true to yourselves and evolving your sound in the way you want to evolve it rather than a way that will make it commercially successful yeah i don't think we'd have written the album in the sound it is i think if we were too concerned about you know being sort of uh getting it into like a popular market i mean like i i do a lot of like i'm, I'm on tiktok quite a lot for for band purposes and like obviously there are bands that have blown it like bad, bad omens have really like mm -hmm. taken off to like a new level and they released the al their album like a year two years ago i think it was so that i think the way people are kind of digesting music and how people are finding what they love about music in such different ways so mm -hmm. i think just just to have it out and just be like you know you do what you want you do what you want and now if we get a couple of dance mixes of it like who knows it might be a lot of fun so yeah. <laughs> so what does the future hold for the band i think it's just to play just to yeah. be live now i think we've in terms of the bands that we are close to and we're going away with hidden mothers for a couple of couple of dates who have like have been real strong supporters of what we do and kind of kind of been like for me, they've taken me under the wing and shown me how to like, you know, how to get in touch with certain people. Yeah. You know, they're a little bit older than us. So I think yeah. that in terms of like uh, how to conduct myself yeah. sort of online as well as I'm talking to certain yeah. people, they've been really helpful. So yeah, we, we want to play anywhere and everywhere. Like yeah. do it. we're not too precious about where we're playing. Like the sort of, you know, we'd love to do like a really small little town village run somewhere. And, you know, there's obviously certain tours that people used to say in some of the bigger mm -hmm. cities but if we can go to like sort of you know places a bit a little bit more in touch i think that'd be really interesting and make some really interesting shows where people feel like when they get to see live music it's yeah. no matter who it is it's an yeah. occasion and that's where you really make there's quite really a make few a difference. around me where i think you'd go down well your sound there's some quite small venues um some quite sort of um which is venues i think that would enjoy your sound where whereabouts is it norwich Oh, I know it's yeah. I think yeah. I think sort of like the furthest east we're going is Hull. Does that count? Yeah, it's still like northeast. That's, that's it. That's, that's, that's the furthest, yeah, the furthest, not near at all. The furthest <laughs> east we're going. So you know, like I know I know Norwich has like uh, is it the waterfront used to be? Yeah, the waterfront. Still, yeah. yeah, like that. Like you'd see that on post. It's quite regular. I don't know yeah. how regular it is now, but yeah, yeah, there's there's a lot of smaller venues around here. A lot of pubs that do live music and. Um, there's a place in Ipswich which is fairly near called the Smokehouse, which is about an 80 capacity venue and time for age. And I think that kind of thing would would work well with your sound. That's, also, that's it would, because they're smaller venues. You even though you're maybe not known around here because it's such a small venue, you'd fill it, and I think that would kind of be better rather than coming and do a 500 capacity and having 50 people in there because it's only 80. And it's like I don't know. I just feel like that would that would work. I think that's our that's our demographic right now. I think we we look forward to them because we don't see them as like as like we we see them as something to be proud of. We can like an intimate venue of 50, 60 people. Yeah. I think the, the we're playing the the whole show is in a place called Gorilla Studios, which yeah. I'm pretty sure may be a practice room and it fits fifty people in it. You know, we've got people coming. It's like a donations entry show, and 
yeah it, like we'd, we'd much have the rather have an intimate venue than like you said be screaming into the abyss and <laughs> just to, just to say we've played at a certain venue like yeah, our our comeback show after um kind of not playing for you was at a place called the Talleyrand in Levenshoom Manchester which is kind of like not very populated in terms of like no bands playing yeah. Levenshoom really apart from the pubs and it was 50 60 people and it was it was rammed it, it was yeah. nearly a fire hazard and <laughs> It, it was just not it, it felt like that was the energy you wanted to cultivate you wanted to create that kind of like intimate sweaty atmosphere <laughs> are you going to apply for smaller festivals next summer yeah that's the plan i think i think with matty on board at illicit i think you know we want to organize ourselves to really like to, to get these sort of small festival shows i know there's quite a lot of like obviously student unions put on like small festivals there's one like in teesside that a band called blight town around who also worked with matty who um yeah we just we just want to we, we feel like we go down really well at these in these small small towns and the smaller city festivals like we're not we don't want to get too carried away thinking right download next year and anything like that obviously that'd be amazing but to be realistic yeah yeah i think it. that's the first thing we said when we started this album was just about setting realistic goals but still yeah. enjoying the process and yeah. not burning ourselves out and being disappointed with the end result yeah the problem with music now as much as it's all changed how we consume it for the better and it's more accessible because it's that much more accessible it's that much easier to release music there's so much of it you can just get lost because yeah. there's just so much a number of times i look at my spotify think what should i listen to and you end up listening to something you've listened to 500 times because there's an idea of choosing it's just too overwhelming yeah no i um i think it is more about why we want to concentrate on the live stuff mm -hmm. like yeah. i i think we all went to see let live when they were a band when they were still going and that live experience is something that still, people still talk about today so if you can capture people's attention for half an hour in front of them Definitely. that that'll last a lifetime Absolutely. compared to compared to you know skipping on spotify here in 30 seconds thinking that's good but you know if they, people happen to capture the captures live and in, in Pink, the dark corner of Ipswich, yeah. then um, <laughs> we'll, we'll have them forever. Yeah. Um, and lastly, give yourselves a shameless plug. Well, um, take it okay, away. coming out September 29th, Pleiades debut album, uh, Affinity With, going on tour with As Living Arrows, October 10th till October 15th, going to be covering the whole of the UK. And we're very excited. What are your socials? Where can people connect with you? Um, connect connect as much as possible on TikTok. I've been putting in a lot of hours there <laughs> at Pleiades Band. Uh, Pleiades Band on Instagram, Pleiades Band on Facebook. And if it's still around when this comes out, threads as well. Brilliant. Thank you so much for talking to me. That's been lovely. Lovely. Cheers, lovely speaking to you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Bye. 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 Bye.